I want to talk to you about stories. I want to talk to you about the power of stories, the power of stories to achieve whatever it is that you wish to achieve in your life, to communicate with people and to do it better. And it's called Lessons from the Top because it's based on largely leaders uh, around the world that I have met. Uh, Bill Clinton, Angela Merkel, Mrs. Thatcher, Tony Blair and others. And the power of their stories to communicate with their followers. Uh, leaders have many qualities, but the one quality that every leader has to have, otherwise he or she is not a leader, is to have followers. And the way you communicate with your followers, most often and most effectively, is to tell stories. Now, there's nothing new in this. this uh, you know, Jesus told stories. The prophet Muhammad told stories. Moses told stories. Moses did not say, look, guys, I've been thinking. Here's 10 rules that we're going to live by. <laughs> he said... Here's a great story. I was up on a mountaintop, and God himself gave me these 10 rules, these 10 commandments, and you're going to do it. That's one of the reasons that story is still with us today, because it's a terrific, powerful story. Now, you're all storytellers. Everybody in this room is a storyteller. You tell stories to get into a great university. You might be called a personal statement, or a resume, or a CV. You tell a story when you go to a bank for a loan to try and get uh, money for a project, or when you try to get crowdfunding for a project. You tell a story when you go out on a date. <clears throat> we all tell stories. The difference between us and leaders is that they do it in a more organized and better fashion. Now, I have to say that I began this sort of uh, research into how leaders tell stories in the most unusual way. Uh, about three or four years ago, I was, um, had to introduce Tony Blair's former director of communications, Alistair Campbell, at a big conference. And before uh, I introduced him, he said to me, what are you going to say about me? And it was just after the Gulf War, uh, the Iraq War. And I said, oh, I'm just going to say you're Tony Blair's former press spokesman. He said, oh, that's all right. And then he got on the stage and he said he was relieved at how nice that introduction was and how short it was because he'd been introduced the previous week as, please will you welcome Alistair Campbell, the most evil man in Britain. <laughs> And I wondered, why did he do that? That was, you know, it was very interesting, because he had quite a difficult audience, actually, but he had the meeting out of the palm of his hand. And I realized that actually an introduction is a very short story. I told one about him, he told a slightly different one. And then during the 2010 election campaign, I uh, was interviewing a lot of our political leaders, including uh, Alistair Darling, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, our Finance Minister, during the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes. And... Um, one night after I had interviewed him, I go home and I switch on uh, the, the television, and there he is being interviewed on another channel by Piers Morgan. And Piers Morgan says to him, bearing in mind the seriousness of the economic crisis, Chancellor, are you good in bed? <laughs> and this was where I realized my journalistic career had gone completely wrong. Because I had never thought of asking him that question. And during that election campaign, uh, David Cameron, who obviously became prime minister, was asked, Had, have you committed adultery? Uh, Nick Clegg, around the same time, was asked, the leader of Liberal Democrats, uh, how many women he'd slept with. And I thought, what is it that has changed? How come, you know, Churchill would not have been asked that story, <laughs> that, to tell that story? Mrs. Thatcher would not have been asked to tell that story. She'd have hit somebody with a handbag. <laughs> So what was it that had happened to our culture and our society and our media uh, that led people to believe those stories, for some people at least, were appropriate? So I began my research by thinking back to all the leaders that I'd met. What did they have in common? How did they communicate? What were the good things about their communication that we could learn from and actually see through? Because they do construct stories. And I realized that every single leader I had met told three basic stories. Who am I as a person? Who are we as a group? And where's my leadership going to take us? And my contention was that you don't care where his leadership or her leadership is going to take us if you haven't bought into the other two stories. That's why the who am I story is particularly important, and it's particularly important in the 21st century, because it's the initial bond that you make with somebody. My father uh, came to mind as I was thinking about this because he started his career as a salesman, and he once said to me, you know, 
You don't sell the product. You sell yourself first, you sell your company second, and maybe you sell whatever it is, your product third. So in a way, storytelling, at least for leaders, is a kind of act of salesmanship. Let's see how this works in practice. So who am I? Well, Mrs. Thatcher, it seems to me, told a wonderful who am I story, because it was five words. Now this is not, quite a lot of the leaders I deal with were very divisive figures, but uh, Mrs. Th Mrs. Thatcher included. But her who am I story, everybody bought into. I'm the grocer's daughter from Grantham. Five words which say, I'm a grocer's daughter, so I'm not that posh. I'm a daughter, I'm not a son, and I'm from Grantham. I'm not part of the metropolitan elite. Very, very powerful story. Now, you could tell all kinds of other stories about Mrs. Thatcher, but that was the one she chose to tell until the Russians were foolish enough to call her the Iron Lady. She had that one as well. <laughs> Bill Clinton, the first time I literally bumped into him, when he was governor of Arkansas, he was, uh, uh, I was in New Hampshire, and he ha had not declared that he was running for the presidency of the United States. I was standing in a hotel lobby at 7 o'clock in the morning. He came running in. So there's this very big guy. He's hot and sweaty. He's wearing blue lycra running pants. It was a sight. That's all I can say. <laughs> we struck up a conversation. He's very, very charming. Very, very charming. Really lights up the room. And during the course of that conversation, he happened to say, you realize I'm just the boy from Hope. Hope, Arkansas, was the town that he grew up in. Actually, it was a few years later when I did some research when I found that actually he did a lot of growing up in a town called Hot Springs, which is a gambling town. <laughs> that wasn't the story he chose to tell. And that's part of it. Just like the CV or resume that you do when, you, when you're applying for a job, you don't tell the whole truth about yourself. You tell the bits that you want people to remember. That's the sensible thing you can learn from leaders. That's one of the lessons from the top. When it comes to who are we, well, that's slightly more difficult. London told a great who are we story, great multicultural city, when capturing the Olympic Games in 2012. It was a terrific story, and I was very proud that this is a city I live in. Um, political parties do it all the time. You know, uh, Clinton, uh, one of the things that really impressed me about him was he was marketing what he called the new Democrats. Not the old Democrats, we're the new Democrats, whatever that means. Uh, we've had old Labour, we've had new Labour, and now with Ed Miliband we have One Nation Labour. On the right, uh, both the Conservative Party here and also the Republican Party of George W. Bush talked about compassionate conservatism. Now, that was not a phrase that kind of fell from heaven. That was an attempt to tell a very brief story to stick in voters' minds. First time I heard it was in 2000 at the Republican convention in Philadelphia. And I happened to be standing there with an old friend. And uh, Karen Hughes, a very bright woman who worked for George W. Bush, came up with the phrase. George Bush said he was a compassionate conservative to the Philadelphia convention. I said to my mate, what does that mean? And he was an old-time Republican. He said, well, anything we were in the past that you don't like, we're not that. <laughs> and anything we were in the past that you still like, we're still that. <laughs> that's the who are we story. And again, I'm not really concerned with where leadership is going to take us. That's a matter of policy, and uh, it's a matter of, 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 uh, that we can debate. But those two stories, who am I and who are we, are really important for whatever you do and whatever any other leaders do, leaders of tomorrow. The other thing I discovered when doing this research was the best leaders always confront the worst other people think of them. I've chosen as an example of this um, a great leader. Uh, she's a businesswoman. She's called Dolly Parton. Um, you may know her for other reasons. Uh, she actually runs a thing called Dollywood, which is a theme park in East Tennessee. She uh, makes sure that kids in homes that wouldn't have any books get books. She's a very, very strong advocate of literacy. I was lucky enough to visit her in her home a couple of years ago. I did an interview with her, and we, had, we got on very well. We did a lot of talking. And one of the things I said to her was, do these dumb blonde jokes not get on your nerves? And she said, nope, because I know I'm not really dumb, and I know I'm not really blonde. <laughs> She also said, it takes a heck of a lot of money to look this cheap. <laughs> She's a very, very smart woman, I promise you. She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew the story she, as Dolly Parton, the performer, was telling, and that was the story she was telling me, 
And behind it, it was a very, very smart storyteller. So remember that the best leaders always confront the worst other people think of them. Ronald Reagan uh, is a president whose reputation never really translated to this side of the Atlantic. He was sort of ridiculed as a bit of a cowboy, uh, not very attentive, just an actor. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into where his leadership took us, but in terms of being a storyteller, he truly was the great communicator. That's what he was called in the United States. And he was able to communicate with the people he needed to communicate, which is not perhaps the people in this room, the people in Europe, but American voters. And he was extremely popular. Um, to give you an example of his storytelling technique, which really stuck in my head, when things were going very, very badly in the White House, uh, he was asked, why is it that the State Department doesn't seem to get on with the Defense Department and nobody gets on with a National Security Advisor and your management seems to be a complete mess? He said, well, I guess that's because the right hand just doesn't know what the far right hand is doing. <laughs> nobody remembers what the mess was, but anybody who was there remembers that little story that he told. And a friend of mine, who was a, a very young journalist at the time in Lebanon, told me a story which changed the way he thought about Ronald Reagan. He was never a big fan of his policies. But when he came back to the United States, he was asked to go into the White House and do a briefing to some of the White House staff, which he did. And he was astonished to find the president came in the room. And at the end of the briefing, the president, Ronald Reagan, said to him, what's next for you? And he said, well, I'm going to go to a hotel room here in Washington. I'm going to shave off my beard, and I'm going to fly to New York to meet my editor-in-chief. And then I'm going to go back to Lebanon. Reagan said, why are you shaving off your beard? He said, because my editor-in-chief thinks beards are scruffy and unprofessional, and it's more than my job's worth. So that's what happened. He flew to New York, and then he flew back to Lebanon, and he started growing a beard again once he got back safely into Beirut. Two weeks later, his editor-in-chief called him up. What the heck did you say to Ronald Reagan? <laughs> Why? Well, we had breakfast with him this morning, the Association of uh, Newspaper Editors, and I was haranguing him for his ultra-conservative, illiberal policies. And he said to me, I might be ultra-conservative and illiberal, but I let a guy wear a beard. <laughs> now, my friend never really changed his opinion of Ronald Reagan's policies, but he did change his opinion of Ronald Reagan as a person. And it was that personal connection which led him to a great deal of respect. And it's true, I think you will find it's true in your own lives, that stories have a particular power. People remember the stories. You'll remember the Beard story, and possibly you won't remember much about his economic policy. I want to conclude with um, one story that happened to me very briefly, but showed me that even terrorist groups can change. I mean, Osama bin Laden was a storyteller uh, to the people he had to connect to. So were the IRA. Many years ago, uh, there was a jailbreak from the Mays prison in Northern Ireland. A lot of IRA people got out. Uh, a few years later, a couple of them were caught in Holland, caught with a lot of arms and explosives. I think it was 100,000 rounds of ammunition. And they were jailed in Holland. The British wanted to extradite him. The Irish said, we're freedom fighters, the Irish prisoners, IRA prisoners. We're freedom fighters. You can't extradite us. I managed to get into the jail to talk to these guys. They had long hair and beards, and they wore iron sweaters. They had boots and jeans. And I made a film about extradition and whether they, they could be regarded as freedom fighters or terrorists. I thought nothing more of it. Years later, I travel with the Clinton delegation when they're putting the seal on the Good Friday peace agreement in Northern Ireland. One of the two guys I'd seen in the prison comes out of Stormont, the parliament in Northern Ireland. He's wearing a very nice suit and shirt and tie, shaven, good haircut, and he recognized me. And he said, Gavin, I want a word with you. And I thought, hello, this will be interesting. We went for a little walk, and he said to me, tell me, do you think I should smile more on television? <laughs> that was the moment I knew they changed their story. That was the moment I thought that peace might actually come to the island of Ireland. That was the moment he was communicating very clearly through a very simple story that things were going to change. And if you don't believe me about the power of stories, maybe you should believe um, the power of stories and storytellers like Julius Caesar, who wrote about his own exploits in the third person. Or, as everybody knows, Winston Churchill. Churchill once said, history will be kind to me, for I will write it. <laughs> Good luck with writing your own stories. Thank you very much. <clears throat>